Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Alton McDowell. I co-head the technology and disruptive commerce group here at JP Morgan in our middle market banking practice. And I'm excited to have some of my colleagues on to have a really interesting conversation. But before we get into that, let me do some quick introductions. I just introduced myself. Let me turn it over to my partner, Nate Moyer, who is an important person on our West Coast practice. Nate, over to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Nate Moyer. I co-head the West Coast for the Technology and Disruptive Commerce team here at JP Morgan. Great. Thanks, Alton. Michelle Ye, I lead our Tech and Disruptive Commerce practice for Texas based out of Austin. Awesome. And then last but not least, I want to introduce Ginger Shambliss. Ginger. Hi, I'm head of research for commercial banking at JP Morgan. In this role, I cover the markets and economy, industry trends, and capital markets. What we wanted to do in the innovation economy is really be a resource to our founders and companies to keep a pulse on what's happening, obviously, in the market, but also within your industries. So from the time to time, we'll actually have thought leaders on discussing things like today. We're going to talk about the consumer but we may delve into topics such as what's you know, happening in tech, industrial, climate change, really anything in the innovation economy. So with this discussion, as I said earlier, we're gonna actually double click down on the consumer. Well, how does this consumer today compare with the consumer from the great financial crisis? Does it seem to be the same? Is it different? What things can we tease out about this? And what are gonna be relevant points for our clients to think about in terms of running their business? The consumer is super important to really not only consumer focused businesses, but all businesses. So with that, Ginger, let me kick it off to you and just kind of introduce the topic and how we should be thinking about it. Yeah, sure. Well, I think really over the better part of a year now, there's been a lot of talk um, among our clients and financial markets um, about a slowdown and potentially a recession in the U.S. And so it's started a lot of conversations around what are the implications of that? Um, and if we look back perhaps at prior cycles or prior recessions, what happened then? What are some of the lessons learned? What are the circumstances today and how does that compare with prior recessions? So if we just think about the last two recessions, I mean, the most recent being the pandemic, which really isn't comparable because it was so unique in its set of circumstances, very extreme and uh, short, um, very severe, but also very short. Um, but prior to that, the downturn in 08 and 09, which was really, um, again, quite a severe recession if we think about the duration of it, uh, the impact that it had to unemployment rates, the impact that it had um, really to financial markets, the economy in general. I mean, it, it took several quarters um, to dig out of that. Now, I think there are some key differences in terms of the setup for the U.S. consumer today, um, potentially heading into a slowdown. Um, then was the case in, say, the 06, 07 timeframe uh, leading up to uh, the downturn beginning in 08. And um, some key aspects of that are that the household sector and U.S. consumers are on very solid footing from a financial perspective. Um, there was a lot of stimulus flowing during the pandemic. This enabled consumers to build up some excess savings um, in their liquidity, um, their cash levels. And we have a lot of consumer data um, at JP Morgan, given our Chase Bank and our, which um, serves uh, close to uh, 90 million consumers in the US. Um, and what we've seen there is that elevated cash levels relative to pre-pandemic um, and another metric we look at is called cash buffer, and that's basically the amount of cash that consumers have relative to their expenses. And that's still running um, elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels. So there are a number of signs that show the consumer is still on very solid footing from a financial perspective. 
Ginger, what's, what's interesting about that, that cash buffer, is I'm actually surprised. I thought it would have been worse given the elevated cost structure all consumers have had, whether that's you know commodity prices, obviously gas prices. So it actually is quite impressive that the buffer is still at, at such a, a constructive level. It is. And I think it, it in large part, it has to do with the significant amount of stimulus uh, that was paid out during the pandemic. There was also a period early on in the pandemic when there was a pullback in spending. Um, but you're right, especially as we moved through uh, 2022, when inflation was running at four decade highs, um, consumers did spin down a portion of that excess savings and of that excess buffer. Um, but it does remain elevated today. Another thing um, that I think is driving that is we've seen a lot of wage growth. We've seen very tight labor markets. Um, and so employment has been recovering and is, is back to above um, payroll numbers or back above where they were pre-pandemic. Um, and wage growth has been running in the mid-single digit range. So those factors combined, I think, are continuing to kind of put those, that income um, into consumers' pockets and enabling them to maintain those, those um higher cash buffers relative to pre-pandemic levels. That's definitely different than 08 for sure, <laughs> where I don't think wage growth was going up at all. And the labor market was not tight. <laughs> much, uh, it was much more muted. Also the labor markets in general, there were, there was, labor markets were, were solid um, heading into the pandemic, heading into the global financial crisis, but they were, nowhere near as tight as they are today. I mean, tight labor markets have really been a hallmark of the post-pandemic recovery where we've seen significant demand for labor relative to labor supply. We've seen far more job openings than there are job seekers. And I'm sure Nate and Michelle, when you talk to your, your businesses, um, what are they seeing in terms of available workers, are they having to pay up to, to maintain workers? And um, what are they seeing in terms of um, their employment base? Yeah, Ginger, I think just to share anecdotally with some of the conversations I've been having with the clients in, in Texas, I think many of them, right, whether they're trying to beef up their sales force, whether they're looking for a new CFO, a new finance professional, or even folks on the ground, it's, a, it's still a very tight labor market. I think it's difficult to find skilled professionals and that has not changed, right? We've obviously seen some industries have had to reduce workforce. I think that's a temporary thing and we'll certainly see cycles, but I think overall, like it, it's still a tough hiring environment for folks who are looking for a specific type of skilled labor. And I think for the consumer, that's a good thing, right? These people looking for employment, they see their wage growth increase. And Ginger, you made the, some comments just on the data, like. The consumer balance sheet strong, and we're comparing that to 2018, it seems stronger than it was back then. But as opposed to 2018, like we're facing all these other challenges with like the war in Ukraine, uh, issues around and a lot of conversation around the debt ceiling. Like when you just think about like consumer confidence, like how are those sort of non-quantitative things affecting the consumer and their confidence in this environment? We have seen consumer confidence and consumer sentiment. Um, those levels have been dropping um, over the past year or so. And, and their consumer sentiment tends to um, reflect a bit more how consumers are feeling about the inflationary environment. And that's near all time lows. So that it's not that surprising considering we're running at, at still elevated inflation. It's easing a little bit, but um, remains pretty elevated. Consumer confidence is certainly down notably from where we were when we were kind of first coming out of uh, the pandemic and, and lockdowns and the like. And um, there was a, a big sort of surge in economic activity. Consumer confidence had, had jumped. Um, it, since then, it has been coming down. But consumer confidence is still 
sort of at the average level of a longer term range. So it that in and of itself doesn't look overly concerning, but that tends to reflect a bit more how consumers are feeling about their employment. And so that's something where um, we've heard a little bit about reduced savings rate levels for the consumer. And that is definitely coming through in the data. Consumers have been spending less of their income over the past year. Um, than relative to, to longer term historical average trends. Um, but I think that it also reflects, again, this very tight labor market. I think when consumers feel confident about their job security, or even if they, if they are laid off, they could basically walk across the street and get another job. I think that tends to um, give the consumer confidence to keep spending. Um, in this environment, even when prices are higher. And so I, I think we have been seeing that um, over the last six months or so. The other point about the consumer, which I found, <clears throat> and not that everybody's an economist, but fascinating, the percentage of GDP that is driven by the consumer, what percentage is that, Ginger? In the U.S., uh, consumer spending makes up 65% of GDP. 65%. And so sometimes when you talk to clients, maybe not in the consumer space, but even in tech or whatever, they don't, some people don't realize that the consumer is so important to GDP. If they stop spending, it will trickle throughout the rest of the economy. So even if you're not a consumer focused business, some of these indicators that I would be looking at, like you were just talking about the tight labor market, wage growth, all that stuff becomes important in terms of the GDP calculation which will impact everyone because no business is going to be bigger than the economy. So I always find it fascinating as you're having conversations about the consumer and people don't think they're directly, a, you know, kind of impacted by the consumer. It really is. So I, I yeah, just, that's right. And we spend a ton of time uh, looking at the consumer and, you know, the health of the consumer. And again, I, I spent a lot of time talking about um, the, the excess cash levels and that, but maybe it's important to also think about um, the liability side or the debt side that the consumer is carrying, because this was really something that, um, again, kind of uh, tipped the scales in the lead up to the 08, 09 um, downturn was because the consumer was was riding, there was a lot of debt, there was a lot of low credit score mortgages out there, um, a lot of adjustable rate mortgages, which really um, caused significant headwinds when, when interest rates uh, started going up. So on, on the debt side, um, the picture is much better today than it was um, in 07. Um, we have had a significant significant amount of housing activity over the last couple of years, but the average credit scores have been quite high in the 760, 770 range. Um, there is very little subprime mortgage activity out there, um, very little adjustable rate mortgage activity. So the average rate on mortgages has been locked in in this kind of low 3% area. Again, if we think about consumer debt overall in the US. Um, so that's good and that tends to, that's a very large portion of overall consumer debt is mortgages. It makes up about two thirds of overall consumer debt. Um, a couple of other areas where I'd say we're seeing some normalization, nothing that's really flashing red or even um, or even yellow at this point would be uh, trends that we're seeing in auto loans um, and also credit cards, credit card debt and borrowing. Um, these are areas where the debt levels have been rising, but they're just sort of returning to normalized levels. And especially if we look for um, things like delinquencies or late payments, that kind of thing. That also, it's just normalizing into long-term average levels. Um, previously, they had been much stronger. 
um, a year or so ago. So that's something, again, we're, we're watching. I think it's important to watch because I think it starts to show how the consumer is managing kind of the, their overall finances, their income, their outlays, a higher price environment with inflation, um, and managing their debt load as well. Ginger, just back to the point about how consumers make up 65% of GDP, as in terms of what you've seen as of late, if, in, if consumers are starting to um, save a little bit more, are you, and as you look at how consumers can send their money, cert, are there certain parts, um, whether it's sub-industries or sub-sectors or items that you think are more resilient than others, whether it be grocery bills or if consumers may be delaying large ticket spends or travel, restaurants, like how do you think about that and then relative to the 0809 period? Sure. Well, I mean, one thing that has definitely um, been a, a very pronounced trend over the last six months is consumers spending shifting from durable goods um, and think like home related goods. I mean, and anything that kind of would have come about because of the pandemic, home offices, home gym equipment, things like that. Um, that has really shifted and we've seen a lot stronger spending on um, services. And so dining out, travel um, through mid-April, travel throughput in the US was up uh, in the mid-teens. So we had definitely seen stronger spending in services categories. Now, these are in large part more discretionary categories. So they could be areas that, again, if we end up in a, a broader slowdown in the economy, we start to see more widespread um, softness in labor markets or more widespread layoffs and an uptick in terms of um, the unemployment rate. That might be when we start to see consumers pull back or um, you know, make some of those choices in terms of what they're spending on. And I, I think that's a very natural response to that type of environment. I think when there's sort of less confidence, less wage growth, less job security, they're gonna be pulling back and um, uh, being a bit, you know, having to service their debt levels, things like that, and probably spending less on discretionary items. But I, I imagine that that shift in spending to more of that, you know, travel leisure away from hard lines is impacting the job market too, in terms of, you know, job openings and unemployment, especially as it relates to the mix. I've seen some data, we had just had a very positive jobs report. So I think last week it was, Ginger, when you look at the mix of some of those openings, is it, I would imagine it's also shifting towards that more service, travel, hospitality component as well. It is, and, and recently that's where we've seen a lot of the job gains has been uh, leisure and hospitality. Um, healthcare has been another area that, that's posted some strong job gains of late. Um, so the services area of the, cat, of the employment market had been hit fairly hard during the pandemic um, and was kind of the slowest area to recover. But now that's where we've seen a bit more of the uh, jobs being added back. Um, and it also tends to kind of coincide with where we're seeing the strongest wage growth because some of these perhaps lower skilled um, and, and lower hourly wages, um, they're, they're really seeing the highest growth in, um, in their wages year on year. One question I have, and I'm gonna ask you to put a little bit of a predictive hat on. Um, I'm a founder, I'm running a business, I'm running multiple businesses, I'm in the consumer industry or not. One thing is, I don't always focus on the economic releases. This may come out, this may come out. I don't necessarily always know how it, uh, it'll impact my business. How, what is the data that I should look at if I'm running a business that I should get, that will give me indicators of what the consumer may move to? I don't know if it's gonna be a recession. I don't know if it's gonna be the same consumer back in 2008 and nine during the great recession, 
But what should I be focused on? Like what data points do I look at on a kind of a monthly basis that really will give me indicators? Yeah, I mean, I'd say a couple of things. The, the jobs market or a state of the labor market that comes out every month, I think that is very key because not only do you see the level of hiring or layoffs, but you also get data around wages. And so I think that's important to wage growth. Um, and you can you can get the data by sector uh, where the job openings are happening. If if there are any job productions, um, if that would be in that monthly uh, labor market report. Um, I think you can also look at something else that actually comes out, and this comes out every day, is the traveler throughput. So the, this is the uh, the TSA. These are the travel checkpoints um, at U.S. domestic airports, and you can see to the day how many travelers went through. And because travel is so important because there's so much economic activity that goes around it, whether it's the dining out, the, the car rental, the Uber, the, the, you know, there, there are a lot of other things that go along with, um, with travel. Um, so those would be, those would be some of the key areas I think that um, can give you a sense for um, state of the consumer and um, and really their mindset, I think, in terms of um, where they're spending and how much they're spending. And, and I think to add to that, if I'm a founder and I'm having a, a direct-to-consumer, some type of consumer business, taking that data on top of what you're seeing in your business, are you seeing a reduction in the either the average cost of the of, of what they're buying from you or you're seeing you know smaller amount of consumers? Like to me, you add all of those pieces up and you can then figure out, do I need to pivot my business model to something differently? I think Nate was having a conversation before we started rolling about, you know, this is the type of data you kind of need to figure out one, can I pivot, should I pivot my business? Will I have enough time to pivot my business if all of a sudden the data starts to, um, let's say, erode quicker, faster than normal? All this high frequency data you can get is going to be important for the positioning. And I think that's what we're trying to make sure our clients understand that that's our job too, helping you figure out where is that data, what we are thinking about, what is Ginger's point of view about the consumer here in the near term and in the long term. And that's what we're hoping we're kind of getting out of these conversations. Yeah, maybe one other data point um, that also comes out monthly that I think it would be helpful for consumer facing businesses is the retail sales report. Mm -hmm. So that comes out monthly. It's got some aggregate numbers. It's got some year to date numbers. It's also got numbers by category to kind of um, indicate trend, trend lines along these. Now, with all of the high frequency data, it's always very important to look at it on a trend. You don't want to be basing, uh, you know, many decisions off of one singular data point. Um, so it's always important to look at the trend, look at the, um, and then the context of where um, where it is versus history, and then also. Again, that trend of which which direction is it headed? Um, I've been having this conversation around the labor markets, um, particularly when we got out the the, um, the May jobs report. Because if you just look at the data, the labor markets look very strong, and they are. Um, but if we think about where labor markets were maybe six months ago, maybe we're seeing that there's some moderation in some of these areas that have been just exceedingly tight and where wage growth has been incredibly um, strong. Maybe it's starting to moderate a little bit. And so it is important to um, always to think about it in a broader trend and with some context around it. No, that's a very good point. Ginger, I think as we spend some time um, with some of our consumer companies, so whether it's food, beverage, apparel, footwear, et cetera, right, there's the notion of premium brands and then probably like the more moderate priced brands and then the value brands. And I think a lot of the 
clients that we have maybe in the premium category have seen a very resilient consumer. So as we think about like, do we, when do we think that's going to change potentially? Cause I feel like in the 08, 09 period, right? That's when you heard stories of everyone's at the grocery store buying canned soup again, right? Like are we, that's going to cause that to potentially shift because I do think a lot of consumers enjoy their premium brands and, and they have a lot of loyalty and they don't want to give those up. Like, what are some signs that we should be looking for? If we yeah, start so to- it, it, it's a really good point. So something else that I've um, been thinking about and, and analyzing is, again, kind of consumer balance sheets. And we've already talked about the liquidity levels. We've already talked about um, what's going on with consumer debt. But another aspect of consumer balance sheets is um, the value that they have in their homes. And that is a significant, it's almost 30% of consumer assets are home values. And home values are quite elevated. So home prices have come down a little bit from their peak um in the middle part of last year but they're still up a good 30 40 percent from where they were pre-pandemic so we've seen a lot of appreciation in home values and so i think that is um particularly uh a tailwind or cushion for the higher end consumer um and it's it's really not something that we're expecting to see a lot of deterioration we've already seen Um, with the interest rate environment changing so much over the past year or so, um, housing activity has dropped a lot in terms of new home sales, uh, building permits, existing home sales. All of those activity levels have really slowed down a lot, but what's not seen a lot of softness is those home values, and that's because vacancy rates are very low. And so that means we don't have a lot of excess supply of housing in the U.S. So that's kind of keeping those prices propped up, which I think is um, helping consumers overall, particularly the high end. Um, But I think, again, in terms of what might cause that higher end consumer to pull back or treat down would probably be, we need to probably see a bit more of a pronounced weakness in the labor markets. So I think that is what would really shake that consumer confidence more broadly, cause kind of a retrenchment, an uptick in the savings rate, um, or potent, potentially, I mean, there's other risks. And I know Nate talked about some of the geopolitical and some of those, you know, broader scale market risks that are out there. I think if um, if there was significant financial market stress, um, you know, ongoing stress in the banking, regional banking sector, things like that, those might be other reasons that consumers might, you know, pull back on, on their spending levels as well. Thank you, Ginger. Hopefully you found this discussion interesting. Maybe it changed your mind about how to look at your business, also looking at high frequency indicators. Or just thinking about maybe I need to pivot my business based on the data and how it comes about. If you want to learn more about whether it's this topic or other topics we're going to have in the future, please go to www.jpmorgan.com forward slash innovation economy. There you will find a lot of useful information regardless of whatever business or industry you're in. Until the next time, we look forward to speaking to you.